Too many warnings. <laughs>
And my faculty and sometimes students like to test me to see if I actually know the mission by heart without reading anything. And yes, we advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the global community. Are you okay? And as you look at some of the post-it notes, I think that's what gets really inspired about who we are and what we do. And I would encourage you before you leave tonight to just sort of look at some of them. In fact, one time I thought there was one that was not very um, you know, good because it was at the very bottom of the wall and I went to pick it up and throw it out until I read, it said, work my way to the top. And I just thought that was pretty clever. And a couple of times I have to you know, crush them to say not appropriate for prime time. But most of them really talk about their dreams, their aspirations, what they want to achieve, whether it's an internship, whether it's an entrepreneurial opportunity they want to take advantage of, whether it's a particular corporation they want to go work with, how they want to impact the world, their hearts, their dreams, all of that is out on those post-it notes. And when somebody said to me, should we um, you know, paint the wall, I think it's time for those to go down. It was like, no, those are never leaving. They keep me inspired each and every day I walk through the building. Um, the vision for why we're all here, the vision for RIA, vision for what we call targeted affinity councils, are to have these different councils. I mean, all deans at every business school around the country, around the world, has what they call the Dean's Advisory Committee. 30,000 feet, they, they're on the Dean's speed dial of like, okay, what do I do now? And um, but what was really critical is how can we get advisory councils started and continuing with them where they were closer to the student, that they could keep our faculty up to date with what's going on in industry, being really just in time. And that notion and what we call the TAC or Targeted Affinity Councils was alive and well. And shout out to Chris Manning, because I know he was um, instrumental in getting this one started long before I got it. But I wanted to role model what was happening with the reef all across the school. And what has happened is these tacks have taken on a life of their own. And I want to say something about my friend, Roberta Coleman, who helps me raise money for the school. In case you didn't hear that, Roberta Coleman, who helped me raise money for the school. One more time. <laughs> um, well, why we do it is what's really cool. And she talks about it as being a three-legged stool. And I love this concept of the three-legged stool because it talks about our primary mission to really provide internships, career opportunities, and mentor our students, the next generation of real estate business leaders. The second um, leg of the school is that curriculum piece. How do we really ensure that we're providing cutting edge curriculum to make the students that hopefully many of you will hire to be the best that they can be? And third, how do we raise the funding to provide things like scholarships, to, uh, to be able to fund new professorships, and something I'll talk about in just a minute, a center for real estate something that is a real dream of ours that we think we can make happen in the next couple of years. Now, that's what Roberta calls the three-legged stool, but I think all stools to be, to be comfortable need a cushion. What is on that cushion? On that cushion is you guys, it's the network. In fact, let me ask out on the lawn, how many deals got made tonight? A few of you have some, uh, you know, some hands here? The networking of bringing you all together for events is not only the network with students, but also you network with each other. And there's people you might not have seen uh, for years or you're meeting people for the first time. And I know I walked into one of those uh, little meetings where a deal was going down. But I share that because those three legs plus that cushion are what makes the tax so powerful. So I hope to model this reef with all of our other tax. We have one in finance, we have one in entrepreneurship and family business. There's a number of them and there's some overlaps. And ultimately we want a member from each a council to sit on the Dean's Executive Council. So it works like an integrated gear to improve the school and drive the rankings, drive reputational excellence, which is at the core of our strategic plan. And I think we've had a pretty good start over the last four years. We're coming to our fifth year and the end of our strategic plan. And we'll be engaging many of you as we write the next strategic plan for the next five years. Um, but what the REIT has done is amazing. And I want to talk about this group of people who have made this so huge. Now I'm doing the Mark Macedo part. This is so important. They started something, and I want to thank Mark and Erwin Busey, who's also here and also sits on my Dean's Council and also knows that I fundraise for the school. A lot. Thanks, Mark. Anyway, um, I wanted to share that one of the things that we did we wanted to do is the REIT came to me my very first year and said, we want a real estate major. And I said, well, if you hand me $20 million, I'll build you one. Um, seriously, that's the kind of money that it takes to build the kinds of programs that you see. But I said, we're entrepreneurial. We don't have to start there. I want to get there, by 
way, but we don't want to start there. Let's start with a certificate where the faculty who teach our students are the industry leaders. They're the four panelists that are sitting there. There are many of you in this room. And working with my senior director for business development strategy, Nola Wanta, Erwin was a key part of that. There are a number of people that were involved in that. I see Larry Calvers is here, our associate dean of almost everything. Used to be everything, but we now have an associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I know I'm going off script, but that's okay. Um, I, you never give me a microphone. Um, anyway, I share all of that because I think what's really cool about the certificate is now students get a chance to dive deep in these modules that are taught by all many of you, industry leaders. Um, there are some core modules they take and then they have electives. And we have been able to offer that certificate to students across the university and the law school. So we have students coming and taking these sessions. We started this during COVID. The amount of content that was curated during one of the most difficult times in higher ed actually was what gave us entrepreneurial energy. From that certificate, we're hearing we want more, we want to do more. And I really believe that from that, we will start to build the concept of the Center for Real Estate Education. And we can do it in such a powerful way here at LMU, and we can do it in the center. Now, some of you might say, well, where are you going to put it down? You look like you've had, you know, space is kind of at a premium here. I just want to tell you that the name of the business school is for sale, somewhere between 50 and $75 million. You can have your name on it. If you laugh, you think I'm kidding, I am not. So if you can't write that check to me, introduce me to somebody who can. Because what you're doing is you're building the educational experience for the next generation. And uh, as Erwin and I were talking earlier, we were talking about the market and the cost of money and all of that. And his comment was, well, there's a market in every market. So I firmly believe it's something we can do and I want to do it in my first five years here. So um, those are some of the things that are happening. Uh, I want to thank the REIT for the scholarships they give, for the goals, the bold, bold visionary goals they have for what we can do for our students. Um, I'd love to be able to hire uh, faculty to teach courses. We already have quite a few courses that are um, cross-listed in some of our disciplines. Um, and the panels, the ongoing education, events like this that bring us all together to learn is really that commitment to Jesuit education and our commitment to lifelong learning. So um, see me or Roberta if you want to you know, write the check for 50 or 75 million. We also take smaller figures, just letting you know. Um, see John O'Connor or Edgar if you'd like to join the REIT and you're not a member. We're a fun group of people. We know how to eat, drink, and educate students. Um, and uh, with that, you didn't come to listen to me. You came to listen to the experts here. Oh, but I'm told that I am supposed to um, wave a raffle. I have no idea what the gifts are, but the lucky winner is they're on the podium. Oh, there's three mystery bags. And the first person to win is from Next Phase Construction. Um, and the winner is Peter Sennett. And our second lucky winner is, it's amazing, you go from host of the show to the damn boys. Um, and the next guest, the next winner is Mark Vicaria, president of Ames Warner Corporation, and also an alum. A few minutes ago, what was really fun is I think he was there last night when we did experience LMU for prospective students to LMU. We had over 100 parents and students learning from our faculty, our current students, and uh, a little dog and pony show for me. Um, and our last one is Brandy Nichols from the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency. Whoa. Andy, I promised we have been safe all night and continue to be so. Anyway, thank you all. Um, I look forward to learning from the panel. It's now my uh, absolute honor to uh, introduce a friend and the moderator of our panel, um, Edgar. It's all up to you. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, we first met about four or five years ago when we first started the uh, career, and, uh, and at that time, I'm going to tell you that the level of, uh, um, of attendance was this low. And look at now, every event that we have, we have over 100 people. And that's because of me, a lot of people that want to see you, they want to hear, and want to know what's going on with LMU. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What I want to do tonight, we want to go from uh, the macro level 
ocean, and we're gonna go deep into that conversation and we have some questions that the panel has already got ahead of time. And before we begin, I just wanna get a feel of the room to see uh, who are the students and, uh, and parents and alums. So can you raise your hand? Uh, how many students do we have? Okay, we have about 40%, all right. And alums? Wow, great. And this is the question that I always wanna know and I wanna be proud of asking this question. How many parents do we have tonight? Oh my goodness. Can you stand up please? <laughs> <laughs> all of you, all the parents. All the parents. I'm going to tell you that I'm proud to be here and uh, to share the stage with all of you guys. Thank you, friend, for listening us. Okay. Uh, I own a brokerage company in Torrance. I uh, set up my company about 18 years ago. And uh, since day one, I decided to not to go work for a big organization. I just wanted to have my own uh, company. And I purchased an office building. And uh, after that, my parents and my family started purchasing some more real estate. And I can tell you that um, I love this career. I love what I do. I don't feel that I work, you know? It feels like uh, I'm happy to go to work. And and every day, I, I, by the way, my girlfriend's here tonight. She can tell you that I work 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day. And I really, it doesn't feel like work. Uh, and I hope all of you guys uh, feel the same way um, because the panelists, um, they feel the same way that, that I do. They work tons of hours and are successful. And I'm lucky to be sharing the stage with the panelists tonight. Uh, we're, we're gonna go get all the feedback and we're gonna learn so much about what's happening in the industry right now. And over the past 18 years, I have seen two recessions myself. In 2000, that's when I purchased my office building. Uh, I got this property for less than 400,000 office building more than 2,500 square feet in prime location. And I, I saw that market going down and it went up again. Then I saw the recession in 2008 and um, you know the prices went down and a lot of opportunities. And right now we are leaving that next cycle. You know, right now we're like in a, in a transitional period right now. No one can tell you what's gonna happen in two years. I can tell you that much, no one. We can uh, we'll go into more of the details about um, uh, all the interest rates, going, what's going on with the interest rates. But um, but I can tell you that what I want to do tonight, I want to learn from every single panelist what they're doing in their sectors. And I want to get all the feedback possible because what they say, I want to I want to practice that tomorrow or maybe tonight. So we have real estate, we do sales, we execute. In Dale Smith, you executed today to deliver the message, you know, and the message is clear. And I thought this is, we, it's the same energy, same culture we have, you know. All of us, we have the same purpose. Uh, so it's a win-win for all of us, our group to be con collaborating with you and also LME with us. And so tonight, uh, let's get down to learning from the panelists. So here we go. How did you get to start starting your career, Mr. Tony Azi? Let me turn my microphone. <laughs> Hello? Perfect. So I'll give you the long version. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I graduated May 4th uh, with an accounting degree. You know, we all go to get a job. I got interviewed by Tushras International. They hired me and they wanted someone who spoke three languages and to be an auditor between Europe and the East. When it came to the pay, it said $24,000. Let me think of it. <laughs> so, fast forward, we get invited by one of the students who was here, a good friend of mine, with a group of people at LMU. You can hear me in the back. Okay, here we go. So, we got invited to the parents' home in Hanko Park. After lunch, her dad walked in, successful businessman. I said to them to have a drink. I said, if you are a kid like me now, graduating from school, what would you do? He said, I want to real estate. I said, can we have lunch tomorrow? So the next day, I went to his business. We had lunch and dropped my back of exam and the accounting and went to real estate school. And that was the beginning of my career. Did the residential for one year. 
And one time I was at the dinner party in Romania, the condo that I sold year after I started. One of the neighbors had issue, I helped him with it. And he said, what do you do? I said, I'm in residential real estate. He said, how do you like make $100,000 a year selling commercial real estate? My antenna went up, I said, well, $100,000 a year, 1985, that was a lot of money. So he called Marcus Amelie job at the time it was hard BP, he was managing the office in Encino. Went for several interviews, and 37 years later, here I am. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. So I went to LMU in, in 1982. I graduated. I didn't know anything. I was uh, a kid that basically had, had uh, you know, taught tennis and swimming or whatever. I sold tax shelters over here on um, Culver Boulevard. So I went to graduate school. And uh, at that time, it led me to graduate school without a bunch of experience and stuff like that, different than it is now. So I went in there and then basically turned around and became a lender. I realized, well, what am I going to do with my career here? I mean, I'm done with graduate school. I have no virtually no experience that's worthwhile. So I overpromised my employer. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to kind of hit it. I had two weeks to learn how to use these computer programs, which were just coming out at the time. Bear in mind, at the time, people were still smoking cigarettes in their office. We didn't have fax machines. <laughs> <laughs> One guy showed up with a hat on still with a little, you know, kerchief and stuff. And then I went to CB commercial. And then I started out on my own. So I was going to tell you, if John, I just had dinner with Ben Schwab, who's one of your, one of your colleagues yeah. out of San Francisco, <laughs> and, I, and the owner of your company, George Marcus, I've been his banker. Oh, right. So at least, you know, I got some acknowledgement. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy working for George. I love George. <laughs> people say a lot of bad things about people. You know, find this, this, real estate is a gossipy industry. <laughs> it's a hand house. Yeah, okay. So and so, or whatever you want. To <laughs> and that guy's great guy. He was a great to me. Keith Berkey. But, you know, it's a small little world here. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. And then, you know, I was also going to say, congratulations on setting this up. This is a really, really good idea. I'm glad to see how great my school's become over all this time. I'm so gratified by all y'all for setting this up. We're very happy to see you. I'll tell you the story about Mr. Dawson, you know, how we met, you know, one of my best friends, Dana Wilder, he ran a uh, Marcus and Elvis shop in El Segundo for, I don't know, over six years or so. Yeah. yeah. And then one day he said, Edgar, you know, I went to San Diego. I'm not in that office anymore. But I'm going to introduce you to Dawson, who's excellent. He has tons of experience. He knows how to manage people. He knows how to take care of uh, uh, all these brokers uh, with all these issues going on. So, I'm happy to have you, Dawson. Yeah, no, th thank you, Edgar. And I know some of you guys are probably thinking, how did I sneak my way onto this panel? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, Edgar mentioned it, but I, I sat on it. I had the opportunity to sit on a judges panel for one of Mark Macedo's classes. And they were doing like a pitch, like selling an OM and speaking to the upside and all that. And I was just like blown away by these kids that were like, Kind of checking me on my own financial knowledge of like a real estate transaction. I'm like, oh, gee, I'm like, yeah, I haven't looked at that stuff in a while. And it was just incredibly impressive. And I just knew I had to get plugged in with the school and, and this alumni network and uh, hopefully, you know, get some of the talent that comes out of this uh, campus to, to come to my office and, and um, help drive our operation. And so I got to know Edgar and, and he invited me to participate tonight and I couldn't have been more grateful. Uh, my story is uh, a, a little bit different, you know, candidly a little bit shorter than, than these two guys over here. Um, but I started on the East Coast. Um, I am originally from Annapolis, Maryland. A lot of people in my community worked on Capitol Hill. And so I thought politics was the way to kind of provide a, a good life for your family. Did that for six months and realized it's the worst thing ever. And, uh, I'm not, I'm not made for it. Uh, and so I had a family member who was a broker at Marcus in our DC office. Uh, basically, you know, begged my way for an opportunity with the regional manager out there, and 
just uh, committed to working as hard as I possibly could to get a, you know, my brokerage business off the ground, which is really what it takes um, in this avenue within this industry. Um, fast forward, uh, four and a half years later, I moved into management. I always enjoyed working with agents um, more than clients. And so the, the role suited me well. Um, kind of, uh, you know, marinated on the East Coast for a little bit, and then they moved me out here to uh, run our El Segundo, you know, South Bay Long Beach operation. And it's, uh, it's been a great move. I'm, hey, I'm Dawson, how many uh, agents do you have in that office? Between the two, we got 51 agents. Uh, <laughs> most of them are uh, agents or brokers? Yeah, almost exclusively brokers. Got it. Got it. Hey, how many brokers can I hire, well, including myself? Welcome, guys. I love to be a broker. I'm telling you, especially when we do our dual agency. It's a broker job. <laughs> Two commissions. Paul, <laughs> oh, welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy to see you, Paul. Again, yeah. Paul has tons of experience in private equity, and now. Uh, we're going to learn so much about your deals that is happening right now. But uh, if you can uh, talk a little bit about your career, how you just started? Sure. Happy to do it. So I graduated in 2009. So I was in 40% uh, of the group's seats uh, 13 years ago. So my career trajectory, I graduated in 2009, which was a horrendous time to go into the market. Um, so anyone who's sitting in the crowd and maybe reading the Wall Street Journal every day and getting nervous. Um, don't be, you know, I think recessions are really good times to get into the real estate industry because it forces you to cut your teeth and it forces you to be hungry. Uh, the market is certainly not going to give you anything. So um, yeah, I think it's a great career. Uh, echoing what Edgar said, I, I enjoy my job. I really love it. My career path after I graduated LMU, I worked for a company as an intern that specializes in flipping apartments. Uh, the company is called Baskin Group. They're in Orange County. So I spent a couple of years there, bought $250 million worth of multifamily apartments. Coming out of the last cycle, I didn't want to get pigeonholed as a multifamily guy exclusively. So I went to another company that did office and industrial kind of fix and flips. And then I wanted to see the world from the other side of the table, from kind of the big money side, if you will. So I went to work at a Boston-based private equity company called AEW. And then from there, kind of realized, you know, working for the man is nice, but I really want to take entrepreneurial risk and I really want to do it for myself. So in 2015, I started my own company uh, buying office buildings. And in the last seven and a half years, we bought about $1.2 billion worth of office across 34 transactions. Our markets are largely in Southern California and Denver. So uh, we've been active in office. It uh, has certainly changed a lot in the last 24 months with COVID. Uh, it went from being kind of a, you know, interesting product type to kind of the, you know, redheaded stepchild of the industry, if you will. So I think that creates opportunity. And there's some questions on here about you know, where do you think the market is going? Where do you think opportunities are? My answer to it is to go to places where other capital sources aren't going. And then once they come back to you, you're in a good spot, but um, well, that's you. it. Yeah, thank you. I want to tell you that we do have a powerhouse panel uh, today. All these panels have extensive work, so much experience uh, that we're going to learn from you. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, what kind of skills do you need uh, to everyone, entrepreneurial or leadership skills or business skills in your profession? We can make a short, maybe a, a minute or so. Yeah. You know, the most important skill in our business, respect the client, know they're smarter than you, they know far better than us, they didn't become successful because they don't know how to do it. They did it way ahead of us. So when I walk in a meeting, I turn on the good, the bad, and this is what we're presenting. And you level with them, they respect you. You may not make the first deal, but in the long run, you're going to make a lot of deals. So don't shorten your career, you think you're going to outsmart anyone, you're not. So that's one. As far as being an entrepreneur and business skills, uh, you have to be driven, you have to be determined. Uh, it's a tough business we're in, it's a cutthroat business. 
And when you walk in a meeting, when I interview someone who wants to work for me, I said, if you don't make it here, what would you do? Well, I may be able to do this, I'm not able to do that, then he's out of the door. The person who tells me, this is it, I'm not going anywhere, I'm going to make it, that's the guy I'll hire. When I started, I had no alternative. I was the only one here, I was an immigrant, went to school, no family, I had to make it. And I didn't see anything else but making my career happen, and that's what I did. So in short, it is don't stop your education because we all go in sales thinking we know it all. Uh, continue learning, reading books, listening <coughs> to whatever you want to listen to, to gain the experience, uh, and just be honest about it. Thank you, Tom. Mr. Alcani? That's good advice. Um, I mean, I think that uh, I think you're spot on about being a manager. Um, I'm a terrible manager. <laughs> Bad. I'm really good deal with that. I think that you have to kind of look down and say what you're good at. And I think what you should do to all of you, because I just think about really mentorship is, yes. is I guess my point is my mentor just passed, God bless him. Um, guy was like 83 years old, fantastic person. Um, but I learned so much from him. And just things that you, you know, you can pass on to others. And it's almost impossible in my mind to do it by yourself. I mean, you might think that you can, but this is a really collegial effort. So I think that you want to find out, okay, what do I really like? What things are going to, where do I fit into the whole process? Is it asset management? Well, I know that better or worse than anything else. It's not really, it's a, it's a balancing point. So I think you look at like valuation. I always like to start off with valuation, no matter what everybody's doing. You want to get to know certain things. I actually put together a little syllabus for everybody if they want it after we're done. Because there, there are certain things you can do and all of it's really good stuff and all of it's really cheap. So I just kept it through where I'd want to have it, right? Nobody was spending money on it. So if you understand that portion of it, I think you can affect so many different portions of the industry because it's all going to basically boil back down to it. Now you're in Los Angeles, I mean, it's probably the most diverse market maybe in the world, maybe one of the best markets in the world, nice place, one of the nicest places to work. So you got 175 different markets is what you have. So to say that there's one market, but which we have some markets, interest rate markets, et cetera. Those, all those things kind of affect you. But again, if you're gonna boil back down to where you're gonna start off, I think that's the, if there's a common denominator of all this stuff, it's really to get into valuation. And you know what? We have a lot of finance. How many finance schools do we have tonight? <laughs> so it's uh, up there, you know. Mm -hmm. How important is that in, in, in that, uh, what you're saying? Well, you're not going to make a real estate deal without money. It's the most capital intensive business in the United States. I mean, good luck showing up for the closing and saying, I'm going to get to you later. Or, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, this, this, this guy, he only gets paid when he wins, right? And he wins. Right, that's it. There's only one guy that's going to basically take down the property. Yeah. So you're going to have to have your capital associations. We'll talk about it in a minute. So I think that's where we're going. We talked, you know, we were talking earlier. Yeah. And you know, what opportunities are going to come up with the blood balance about that? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, there there was three things that really stuck with me uh, when you know thinking about how to be successful and. And, you know, throughout my career, reminding myself, sort of taking me back to my touch point. And one was uh, my first big deal, like big commission as an agent. Uh, it fell out of contract twice. And the second time it fell out, uh, one of the senior level executives at the company was doing like a road show and visiting our office, Mitch LaGuardia. I'm not sure you knew him. Uh, and he was selecting agents to speak with. And I was lucky enough to be one of the agents that, uh, you know, got pulled into the office and I told him, you know, I was like really in the dumps and I told him what had happened. And he said, uh, the people that last in this business are the ones, you know, I'll, I'll put it G rate are the ones that get punched in the stomach and, and keep it moving, you know, keep, keep pushing. And, uh, that just always stuck with me, um, you know, cause there's so many highs and lows in this business, no matter what avenue you're in, you just have to keep pushing forward. Uh, and then secondly, another uh, message I got from a, a high, high level agent out of our Manhattan office was uh, he was talking about how uh, all of the junior brokers on his team were spending all this time looking at their fantasy football teams. 
He was like, if only they analyzed their business and looked at, you know, we're a student of their craft at Tony's point, uh, as much as they were their fantasy football team, they'd be making millions of dollars. Uh, and so that stuck with me and just being a student of your craft and constantly learning, you know, reading the books, listening to the podcasts and, you know, working at getting better. And then just my own mantra, uh, you know, if you want to make 1% type income, then you have to do what 99% of the population is unwilling to do and just outwork the majority of the people that um, you're either in this business with or, you know, that are just, uh, you know, trying to make it happen for themselves. That's a great saying. I like you too. I really like that. Uh, I won't take too long because these guys have all had great mm -hmm. ideas, but I do think that tenacity drive is important. Um, maybe for some of the students that are in here trying to evaluate which career they want to go into and which industry, uh, one of the thing, things that I think would be thoughtful for you guys to think about is what gets you guys excited? What gets you motivated? What are you passionate about? Because if you truly love what you're doing and you're putting in the 10, 12, 14 hour days, they won't, it won't feel as much like work and naturally you're going to rise to the top of your field, whatever that field may be. So if you're passionate about Bitcoin, you know, go all in on that. Just put all your passion and energy to whatever you're most interested in. And then there's a way to monetize it and be successful, whatever industry you go into. As it relates to real estate specifically, I think tenacity is an important one. Uh, the other one that hasn't been mentioned that always gets mentioned is relationships. It's a transactional business. Um, you know, when you're in your career, I'm, I'm 35. Um, you know, I have 20 years of runway with my peer set. So if you do something that's, you know, not on good ethical grounds or, you know, wasn't handled the appropriate way, you're totally isolated from that relationship for my next 20 years of my career. So I always try to think about making people feel good about each transaction and not negotiating so hard where you take the last dollar off the table and really upset someone, which could affect, you know, a longer term trajectory and a longer term, term relationship. Thanks, Paul. So now I'm going to set up the stage. So this is, we're going to go deep and dive into why we're here tonight. We want to make sure that we get the secret sauce from all of you guys. So just to set the stage, you know, the past two, three years, the market was on fire. I mean, I, I specialize in uh, 1031 exchanges over the past 15 years. Mm -hmm. I have developed a model to identify properties. And I can tell you that uh, the past two, three years, my volume of transaction exponentially increased, you know, the past two, three years. As you know, uh, property values uh, without even raising the rents went up. Uh, to give you an example, about a year and a half ago, this property, I, I did a BPO, broker's price opinion at 1.5. And six months later, I sold that property for 2 million 50. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just, my, my clients are astonished at the prices, you know, that's uh, so much appreciation happened in the past two, three years. But this is the past, you know? So now we're gonna know what's gonna happen in the future today, tomorrow, in the future. Nobody can tell you what's gonna happen in three years, but I, we can get a feel of what's happening this year, next year. So let's uh, let's talk about the acceleration of uh, of appreciation. So there's less appreciation going on there as a slowdown in the market. And Tony, in your business, can you tell us about what kind of uh, corrections have you seen in the market? Well, uh, the correction I think started last June. Yeah. When you feel the phone stop ringing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you know something is going on. Yeah. And when you start seeing ads and you know people advertising land permit approved for sale, it's always been the sign from the 80s, the 90s, developers trying to get out before they get to themselves and trying to pass it up on someone else. Uh, so what we have seen there has been stable. Since COVID, when COVID started, rent went down, the vacancy went up. But since then, the rent came back up, vacancy became really low, and prices maintained. Federal government dumped so much money in the marketplace, everybody had money. Mm -hmm. And like nothing happened, and business was as usual. 
Uh, now the second part of the summer, I mean, this this year will do probably around 44 transactions, which is very good year for us. We're still busy. We have another 11 transactions to go for you. Yeah. We're very lucky and blessed in the way we do our business. Yeah. Uh, I like that market. We've seen production probably at this point eight to ten percent so far. Uh, I think the production is going to be far deeper than we have seen. See this, uh, I believe history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. If you look at the chart, any of you have researched from the Great Depression to today, every seven to eight years, you're gonna have a downturn of three years or four years. This cycle has been going now from 2010 all the way to that's 12 years, very unusual cycle. Mm -hmm. And it's a fictitious cycle. Mm -hmm. And how long can it continue? Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing the result of it. So the good thing is, as a broker, you can make money no matter what cycle you're in. If you're a good broker, and you, people will continue. Our industry has changed. There's no longer the mom and pop that own the real estate. It's professional people in the real estate. And if these professionals are not buying and selling, they're not making a living. So it will continue. It's going to come back. You're going to have a break probably for six months. Everybody is cautious to see what's going to happen and where the dust is going to settle. But we'll come back as strong. From brokerage point of view, if you're a really good broker and professional, you know what you're doing. It's a perfect time because it's going to eliminate all the older takers just to get in the business for three years when the market is up, they live on your food and they. <laughs> So in the in the tough market, this is why we thought that it was an easy one. Because our client they need us for more, they need our expertise, they need our knowledge. So we jump from being broker into advisory role and brokerage. And that's far more valuable. It's so amazing that correction uh is not necessarily bad, you know. No, no, correction is not bad at all. That's right. No. Well, it depends if you're the guy that's being corrected. <laughs> Yeah, that's the appropriate uh, space. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think it's going to be like the, during the saving and loan crisis uh, yeah. in 1991, uh, 92, 92, uh, when I sold building in 91 for the lender in foreclosure, and the people they bought it, I resold it for them in foreclosure again in 94. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a tough market. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be that bad, but definitely it will be a correction. Which actually, we can jump into the next question, which is how do you anticipate? This will compare to the past cycles, 2008, 2000, and uh, It's a very good question. So uh, a lot of you probably don't remember Michael well, uh, and few of us here in the room <laughs> well. Uh, when I started the business in 86, it was when Reagan changed the tax law from into a lot of syndicated basically had left. We couldn't depreciate them in 15 years, the fast double digit depreciation. Everything, everything became long term. So a lot of the syndicators, they were just putting doctors, attorneys, and deals just to shelter that went away. So that was a very small cycle, and then it picked up. We went strong all the way to 89, 90, it hit. So what was going on? A lot of construction. Lenders were giving 80% loan to value. Developers were very smart. What they did, they used to rent an apartment, get too much free rent. They don't dispose it to the lender and they get a bigger loan so that 80% was 90%. So when 90 hit, and now tenants are moving out, they said, Hey, if you want to do my lease at the lower rent, I'll go to the next building. Mm -hmm. Now, your debt to service that, uh, that your, your income to service that debt is gone, and the equity you have, that 10% equity, evaporated so quickly, and they get the piece back to the bank. Today, we don't have that fundamental issue. I think lenders are very smart, the way they've been lending, very conservative. So the first segment in the industry I see that's going to be hit is the people that went to the bridge financing, buying real estate, going in, they're going to buy tenant out, increase rent, rehab, and resell or refinance. Those are going to find themselves in a position where, okay, nobody's going to refinance me. My business growth is not what it used to be. Interest rate went from three and a half to six percent. Either you're going to have the capital to come in and to save the investment, or the bridge lender is going to end up with it. So that's the first segment I think of the where you're going to see the change. 
The second is the model, same thing, they won't land the original, they're getting the entitlement, statement whatever, the thing is saying that's gone up, construction costs has gone up, they have to unload and they can unload, don't do that. But the regular apartment building for retail, the people can in with 40, 60 percent. You're not going to see those operations. Yes, it's going to be difficult to operate them a little bit because you're going to lose some tenants. You're not going to have permission of household, for example. I'll give you an example. People are doing loans. A lot of them, young kids, you know, are doing loans, making a lot of money. They're not going to make the money they were making before. So, what do they do? Either they're going to become a roommate with someone because they can't afford their rent, or they move back home. So the escrow officer, so it goes to the title company. So even though we don't have a lot of development, they say we have shortage in housing, but we don't have formation of household when this hits and they need jobs. And this is what you're going to see now the frequency going up. But if you put 40% down, you're going to survive. Uh, it's going to be tough, but you survive. Basically, you have enough equity now, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Awesome, by the way, if I can jump in. Just to put in perspective, right? So this year, the Fed's increase rate is five times, like to Tony's point, right? 3%, now we're at 7%. So that's the weight rate. They're going to meet two, two more times this year. And anticipate three quarter and a half a point. And there you go. Quarter that's right. Three quarter, another. So right now we're at 3% 3, 3 more and another like, yeah, uh, rate hike. So the next question that I have for you, Dawson, is. What's the difference between the last recession, right? Keep that in perspective with the Feds, what the Feds are doing, and what's happening right now in the market conditions among your broker fellows and, and your transactions that you do. Yeah, it's a, I'm an interesting person to ask that question because I was uh, a freshman in college during the last recession. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> um, so, you know, I, again, I, I'm happy to refer to them, Michael or Tony on this, but um, I do have some perspective being in management that uh, I'm not in the weeds and um, you know I get to kind of look from like the 30,000 foot view on what's going on with my team sure you know 51 brokers like we said that are trying to make a living in a market that um, the conditions are a little bit more challenging than what they've been and by the way your brokers which area just to get a perspective South Bay and Long Beach right so uh, I think Tony mentioned it yeah you know the, the obvious difference is that the lending policies are just much more responsible this time around. So you're not going to see these crazy, crazy foreclosures. There's still a ton of liquidity in the market. You know, we are still averaging three to four offers on every single one of our listings, you know, assuming that they're appropriately priced and we're not just trying to hit like a record price per unit. Uh, the benefit of being in a firm that focuses on the middle market is uh, the motivation to sell isn't because when we looked at our 10 year IRR, you know, in year eight, we were maximizing the property and it's time to unload it. Uh, it's because we have a you know college education that we need to liquidate for. We have um, some sort of health issue that's come up that is causing us to have to unload the property because the management burden is too much. So from my team's perspective, it, it really is just continuing to do the fundamental uh, brokerage practices, which is reaching out to people in an advisory capacity, putting together market positioning and pricing analyses for them that allows them to get a comprehensive look at their property and what options they have in front of them, and then helping them pick the most profitable course of action. Uh, so while I can't really compare it to the, the previous recession, since I just I wasn't even sure I wanted to be a, a commercial real estate professional at that point in time, um, what I can say is that as we move through this you know, that downturn or slowdown or, you know, recession, even if it's slight, um, there's still going to be deals that are happening because of the amount of capital that's in the market and just the, the needs and motivations of the private client sector to have to, you know, move their property at any given point in time. And also you set up the stage for Mr. O'Connor and Paul to give me your comments on that. Who goes first? Paul? I'll go first. Um, yeah, I would say just to set the stage, you know, Dawson and Tony both work in multifamily where values maybe have gone up plus or minus 40 to 50% the last two years. So there's kind of this massive 
like capital appreciation event that probably wasn't sustainable. So I think it's important to kind of frame everything in context where you know if Tony thinks values are down plus or minus 10%. It is off of a pretty elevated ramp up in appreciation. So that's one thing to point out. Uh, from my seat as an office landlord, uh, we didn't get the party that Dawson and Tony had the past few years. Been, uh, we've been in a recession for two years already. So uh, welcome to the party, guys. <laughs> So, you know, from my seat, my perspective, I'll frame it maybe on what I've seen relative to the last six months with interest rates increasing. I think values in our space are down an additional 10 to 25 percent. Um, just probably, yeah, in the last 180 days, six months. Um, what's different this cycle versus last cycles for our office product type specifically is there's a new phenomenon work from home, which is, you know, an existential threat to office space right now. So in 2008, there was an over leverage issue creating broken capital structures. In 2000, there was a dot com boom kind of oversupply of office space issue. This one's more existential in nature on, hey, will people go back to work in the office and will they do so in a more meaningful way? And what does the future of office look like in that context? So I think as an office landlord, we're in for kind of a bruiser of a, of a recession. We're already in one, and I think we're going to get hit harder um, with rising interest rates. Um, additionally, there's some secular things happening where institutions are now bailing on the office sector, where traditionally these are kind of the biggest money managers in the world. Traditionally, they were maybe 35% of their holdings in office they're all shedding and bailing on office now and trying to get down to 20%. So they're going to try to shed half of their office holdings. There's kind of a limited supply of buyers in that arena. And then on top of that, you have rising interest rates. And on top of that, you have this existential question of, will anyone ever come back to my beautiful, shiny office building? So uh, all sunshine here on the bluff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. O'Connor. Well, you, you mentioned that you were a freshman in, in college uh, last time you had the, one of these recessions that you were talking about. My suggestion is you pick the wrong recession. Um, mm -hmm. I was a junior in college at this university, and we had a president called Jimmy Carter. Yeah. I won't say anything about our current president, but whatever. They had these strong opinions about how things work who we were very much out of touch with reality and he had these terrible things that happened as a result of his policies the, the, the uh, Iranian hostage crisis for example and we had the Saudis basically telling us now we talk about repeating history what how much oil we're going to get out of them we haven't seen this sort of inflation ever in my lifetime so who knows where we're going to play we know it's not going to be good for the people that have wages. Guys like us, we're going to get more money, ostensibly, because we own stuff or we're trading on properties to go up in value too. But we're going to have some real, real structural problems in the economy, including the, the people that are really losing money, the like guys that are basically paying more, $4,000 a month, a year or whatever, than they have to pay for. So I, I don't know how that's going to play out. I mean, how does that kind of work its way to rents of people's ability to pay? Uh, we know we have enough low cost housing. We don't have enough of any kind of house. I talked to a friend of mine, but we like, called him got a quote from him. Today, he said there were probably 15,000 units a month, something like that, in the United States that were short of housing. How does that work? You know, we've got to have low cost housing for sure. We've got to have housing that's closer to employment for sure. But if we don't have that engine that creates that, we have some real problems. And so, you know, now you have runaway, you know, the net lease market used to be able to buy something, for example, with apartments. Guys go out and they buy an apartment building in a, a, a five cap or a, say a seven cap. Well, you buy it at 14 million bucks. That's great. So now the cap rate on a million dollars, a seven cap is worth 14 million bucks. Simple as math. At a five cap, it's worth 20. Guess what? I just made $6 million. Fantastic. 
guess what? That works in reverse too. These guys, your, your comments are you know, confined primarily to Southern California. Very, what I consider a very insulated market. If you look outside of this market, you look at markets where you're doing that same thing, I'm gonna go ahead and fix it up. I'm gonna put in new refrigerators, I'm gonna put in new tops, whatever you're gonna do, carpets. And you say, okay, I'm gonna put in some money. And then I'm gonna walk away and I'm gonna bring in a capital partner. By the time I'm done with that deal, I'm gonna make 3 million bucks. Great deal, right? Unless it turns the other way. And that's where at. If these rates sustain themselves, and bear in mind that when I was in school here, when I was, you know, my junior year, we were talking about rates at 12 to 14 percent, and there's no reason that we can't go back there. There's no, there's no insulation here, and that, that's what we're kind of talking about is what's the real value of the dollar, and how who's going to invest in a bond or a fixed instrument. You're not going to go buy a, a, a Dollar Tree at five cap right now. Not a chance. Some dentist in Panama. He's not going to buy it. Why would you touch that thing unless he's, he's got some exchange he has to do, right? You want to go into things that are basically you can change the price every day. Parking garages, hotels, whatever it's going to be. Something where you can move prices a lot because that the value of that dollar every day is worth less than it was the day before. That's the problem. And so until they get their grips around it, how can you make a conclusion for evaluation? I was talking about earlier, if you guys are looking for jobs or looking to do stuff, I mean, being an appraiser in this market, because this thing's going to go viciously to the other side. My prediction is we're going to see some cataclysm, maybe not LA or, you know, the Inland Empire, but, you know, you, you start looking at outside markets, Vegas, wherever, Phoenix. I mean, you're going to see some real movement, and that's what's always happened before. They're already at 10%. Are they seeing other things? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so basically, the next question here is about we can uh, tone it down a little bit uh, as far as to talk about directly to students, and they want to know, you know. How they want to structure a deal. Commercial real, residential is different. Residential is going and purchase, uh, you get a, a 30 year loan, you know, uh, and fixed rate. So you're set for different 30 years. But on commercial, as you know, like 10, 20, 30 unit building, uh, you need to rely on the, on the adjustable rate mortgage. So, what are the advantages? Uh, I can uh, talk to Paul or Tony. Uh, the advantage of, of uh, the arm loans, those adjustable loans. In your deals, why, why, why would somebody choose an adjustable loan versus a fix? You know, uh, it, it's a very interesting question, and it's a comfort zone for a lot of individuals. Yeah. Uh, in the past, I believe in taking on my resident 30, uh, 30 year loans, and it was proven to me I made the biggest mistake in passing the bottom line. But at the same time, I wasn't in the financial position I was in today. What I can afford to take a risk and take very well. So, and uh, so I was at a point, my bank came to me and said, You want to have 2% loan, 10 year interest only? I said, How can I say no? 2%. <laughs> so I dumped my very good big, but small loan, and I took the 2% loan. And just you put it in anything, you're going to make more than 2%. But I'm in a position also when it comes to you. If it's seven, eight, ten percent, I can write a check and get out of my loan. So what I can say to people is, to me, it works. A lot of my friends, they like the variable because they can afford to pay off when when it comes to you. If you can and you're on a fixed income, you have a job, and this is what you're going to be making year after year, you're better off probably with a fixed state loan and to be safe. Now, when it comes to the apartment building, I'm not an expert in a single family home. Uh, but when it comes to apartment building, number one, it's very difficult to get fixed rate financing from anywhere. The loan that we see in our industry is five, seven, ten, and it gets more expensive when you get into 10 years, seven years, and five years. And in general, a lot of people that are buying today, they buy five, seven, or ten years old, especially with the syndicator. And they sell. So it doesn't pencil out for them. It's much cheaper, you know, to create some cash flow. They prefer to 
you know, like, oh, electric road variable because it's cheaper than fixed. And that's what they, you know, go after. Uh, so, what's the second part of the question? Basically, you know, uh, three R, five R, seven R. Uh, the three R is too short, in my opinion. But when you're buying an apartment building and you take three R, uh, it's you can't, you know, by the time you get in, you try to turn it that down, try to create value, rehab. You know, three years they go really fast. Personally, I like to see minimum five on my investment, and seven is better. Ten, if the rate is not that different between seven and ten, I'll take the ten, but I'm comfortable with the seven. That makes sense. Paul, uh, Tony hit it, but you know, for the students, high level, the it's a risk reward game, so it depends on your risk tolerance. Uh, using an example, maybe a fixed rate loan would be five percent, and your adjustable rate loan would be. 3%. So, you know, financially it's cheaper money, but it has the variability of, you know, like what's happening today, 3% turns into 7%. And now you're backwards versus a fixed rate loan. So uh, it just depends on your risk tolerance. It's cheaper upfront is the reason why you would do it. But, um, yep. Yeah. But in general, Paul, uh, you know, not too many people keep the loan after they take it. Seven years, ten years, they send them home and yeah. they refinance. It's historically nobody keeps that very long. The other thing, so the number of benefits. The other thing I would say is uh, you can usually get more leverage and more proceeds when you borrow interest only. So maybe the property can only support fifty percent leverage if you're amortizing it. If you get interest only for a shorter period of time, maybe you can get sixty or seventy percent leverage. So you have to put up less equity, less down payment. It amplifies your returns. That's the reason to do it. So the, that's your strategy then to purchase, let's say, a 20, 30 unit building. That would be the next question for Dawson or Mr. O'Connor. What are your strategies to purchase, develop commercial real estate under the current market conditions? What, what kind of strategies uh, can you share with us? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know it's, it's very, uh, it's hard to give advice. Like, if you're already in a deal, and you have your, your business plan in place. It's like you know, back to your, you know, what kind of finances do you want in your property? Yeah. How much? How how long do you stay there? Do you want to own it? I mean, do you are you trying to like replace a tenant? Are you trying to move, you know, the cash flow up by putting money into the property? Are you, you know, trying to subdivide a piece of it out? It's all about your business plan. So I mean, but to, in terms of like deals going forward, we're working on a very large deal. We just we just lost one. Mm -hmm. The cost went up. It's in Austin, great market. Yeah. The cost went up from I think it was fifty-one million to sixty-eight million dollars mm -hmm. in, in the course of less than a year. And they, we were all like, we came in with capital. We still might do it, but the developer had to come up with more money because we, we had a pretty full cool mm -hmm. loan. It was a participating loan. But so I'm going to give you a bunch of it. I'm going to charge a certain amount for this, and then the additional money on top of it, I'm going to get to participate in paying the profit. Right. So, but the blue because it just couldn't, you know, it couldn't sustain itself. Rents had gone up too. Austin's a great market, great place. But it, rents had gone up too, but it wasn't to mess with what had happened. So, this inflation stuff is really, it's going to limit development a lot. So, in that plan, scrap it. We made another one in, in, up in Idaho, it's a, a hotel deal. And they had condos upstairs and went from we were $1,250 a foot. It went from there three years ago, two and a half, two and a half years ago, to $2,700 a foot. Why? Because people are moving out of the, the coastal environment to retire and whatever they're doing, and it's a very thin market. So it's really like it's really market specific as to how your, your plan's going to work. It's like, it's impossible to tell you what's going to work in one market versus another. Sure. You know? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think if you can afford to, uh, you should you, you should wait. You know, this might not be good for uh, our, the brokerage business that, that I run, but uh, <laughs> for right now, you know, seller expectations haven't quite met the reality of the market that we're in. And so you have a pretty substantial pricing gap between seller expectations and buyer threshold. And it, it will be bridged once the Fed stops hiking rates and you know the 10-year treasury kind of settles into place. And 
we become a more stabilized market. And so if you can afford to wait before you deploy your cash or buy maybe your first deal as you know a, a young developer or uh, new principal, then I would wait, let let the dust settle on the debt markets and you know let pricing come back to an appropriate level with the market and then strike. When that is going to be at, I don't know. Right. So well, in my opinion, yeah. and the way I look at deals now, it's a little bit different. It's definitely very difficult to determine what the value is going to be. Yeah. But I will still buy in today's market personally for my own investment. But the way I look at things is a little bit different. If I'm buying an uncontrollable my rents are low, I know I don't have a downside on the rent because my rents are already low. So what's going to affect me is the rise in interest rate. So you're going to buff up your expenses, increase your vacancy, and buy a certain cap that's going to make sense and cash flow to the interest rate. If you can get the deal at that number, you buy it. If not, most likely you're not going to get it because, as Dawson said, the seller don't adjust for six to eight months, and the buyer adjusts seven months prior to anything happening. So that bridge has to take place, and the broker are going to play an important role to bring buyer and seller together in order to make things happen. So deals are still being made today, yeah. but far more difficult than a year ago or nine months ago. Mm -hmm. I see myself far more involved now in the negotiation between the client trying to keep deals alive. And someone has to get, every side has to get to make things happen. But it doesn't mean you stop doing business. Yeah. You, there are ways of doing it, but you have to be cautious. So that's a trend. Go ahead, Paul. Um, yeah, I think from the office perspective, where we have so much uncertainty on what the future is going to look like, we're spending a lot more time looking at what other uses can go into an office building. So we own a building in San Pedro. It's a 13-story office tower. Uh, we basically didn't do any tenant leasing. We got the project re-entitled for apartment buildings. So it's entitled now for 228 apartments. Um, and you can't afford to build that construction because, like Michael said, costs are shooting up exponentially. But you have the bones and the kind of base building. So all you really need to do is kind of carve individual units into the floor plate of the office. So I think that's an interesting take. And I think there'll be a lot more of that uh, in the future of real estate, you know, taking projects and changing uses. So we're doing that from office to resi. We're also doing that on some buildings we own in downtown Denver and other locations. We have office buildings that we're gonna to try to turn into industrial buildings. So there's higher and better uses and ways to be creative and people are so down on office that they'll just delete you know, the offering when it comes to their inbox. But our view is there's a price for everything. John, you have a question? I do have a question. So in our downtown office sectors, San Francisco being my home base, we have such a lot of uh, people black they're never coming back from it. Yep. Um, I this estimate that there's about 30 percent that are being used currently, there's 10 percent that are actually being occupied by bodies. So 30 percent that are actually being rented versus bodies after coming from how do we convert these giant high rises with, with the TI that we need for plumbing, you know, electricity, etc. To change it from office to actual housing? Yeah, it's a great question. I think office is actually a great, will be a great source for new affordable housing um, because as everyone identified, it's such a need. The answer to the question, the answer to the test is you need to buy something cheap enough for it to make sense. But just to throw out some rough numbers, maybe it's like 200 to 250 bucks a square foot to actually take a vacant office and then mold it into apartments, putting up drywall, putting in plumbing for kitchens and bathrooms and picking beautiful colored backsplashes. Definitely not my specialty. Um, <laughs> so you have to buy the buildings cheap enough to be able to do that. But in order to build a kind of high rise office in downtown San Francisco for even purpose built multifamily, it's probably in the neighborhood of 800 bucks a square foot. So if you can buy an office building for three, 400 bucks a foot, put 200 bucks a foot into it, and you're into it for five to 600 bucks a foot, there's a discount relative to building it brand new. The challenge is you just have to wait for pricing to get low enough in order for that kind of business plan to unlock. And you have tenants in the way too, which 
Uh, since you're a lawyer, you're sort of my least favorite tenant, but I'll kind of be like, hey, John, do the right thing for the city. You own a full floor, the rest of the building's vacant. You just leave, you're like, well, why would you get a name? And I have my rents. Yeah. Uh, exactly. I was going to say, he's not moving back in with me. So. <laughs> But that's that's how we're looking at you know maybe a kind of cloudy business operating conditions and trying to find sunshine in it because there is a need for housing. There's big supply chain disruptions, getting steel, blah blah blah, like painful. But office, you can get product online a lot quicker. So I think Governor Newsom just signed a law, kind of um, expediting that process, and there were some legal, you know, have to deal with CEQA and lots of red tape where that process took us two and a half years to get entitled, but hopefully for the next generation of developers that are looking at this business plan, it'll only take six, nine months so that we can get the housing that we need in these communities. By the way, you know, Paul and everybody, so we have about $57 billion mortgage maturing next year. And uh, in this volatile market, well, how do you handle it? Do you refinance? How do you handle all those loans maturing next year? What's uh? Well, what, what choice do you have if your loan is maturing? You have to refinance. You have to, you right? Have to the cash. Yeah. yeah. And all these loans will be refinanced to a certain extent. But yeah. Unfortunately, what you're gonna have when you have capital call. Yeah. Because rate has gone up so much, and probably the existing I have an existing building now. Yeah. It has a loan from First Republic. Yeah. And if we were selling it and we cannot do literally on the seven million dollar deal, we're gonna get a million and a half less in check than what we have existing. Mm -hmm. So the principle if they don't sell it, they have to come up with that cash. And this is what we're gonna see across the board, capital call or sell. And this is where the opportunity is gonna be for the brokerage and the second and be able to sell these assets, if not from the principal or the lenders. Mm -hmm. So basically, that's the next question uh, that we have. Are your lenders uh, wanting to take properties back if the LTVs are out of mark? You know, the your debt service coverage ratio is uh, too weak. You know, it's a uh, what's what's happening? A lender never really wants to take back a never, property. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's they're not they're not set up for it unless they're it's, they're, they're low to own programs. Yeah. We've all heard of that sort of thing. But yeah. So that's a very small microcosm of the market. I, I think that lenders in general do not, or they're really, you know, I mean, I, I try anything. If you're, if, if you're actually, you know, you're, you're stuck with a building that's underwater, time to go talk to the lender. And um, time, to, well, there, there, there's a workout market out there, and I've done a bunch of workouts, unfortunately, it's never that much fun. And so you, you basically go in and say, I can afford to pay you this much. Maybe they're asking for some check that you have to pay down, whatever. If you're underwater, you know, where the loan is actually, and it's going to happen shortly, where the loan is actually worth more than the property. In our city, in San Francisco, um, you know, you've got buildings on Market Street that are, what, they're, they, they, Dan Crescent sold at $700 a foot, and now they're worth maybe 200 bucks in my mind. You're going to have real loan losses. In Nashville, Tennessee, where you have people moving from here, a bunch of guys, you know, moving out of here, those places. They've been moving out of here and buying a house. Well, you have a house for 200000 You have your house for 800000 And I have my house for a million, too. Well, now you want to go fishing. You decide, oh, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm just going to defend sell my house. Well, who cares if we sell it for 800000 except for us? Because we just lost all of our money. I just lost, like, all of my equity and then some of my debt. So there's real, in some of these markets, there's real exposure and whenever wherever you have like that kind of dislocation i think you have real opportunity to because some people are just going to walk off and they're going to you know it's probably like i said around here pretty limited because you got everything's gone right but other places where it's it's not as big like metro area maybe a million or two million people you're going to see a lot of action it's coming and it's going to happen really fast and, and lenders in general you know, they always threaten you that they're going to come after you with some lawyer. Going to come after you and say, <laughs> they're going to, you know, they're going to come after you and kill everybody, but they really don't want to. In the state of California, I mean, I don't know how many judicial foreclosures there were last year, but I'll bet you it's less than 10, right? So they don't come after you 
In other words, if I guarantee a loan and they say, you're going to come after you, uh-uh, you have one form of action. You're going to foreclose on the building. They're not going to come after you. They're not going to, the boogeyman's not going to hunt you down. But go in first, go in nice, try to work it out up front and say, this is what we've got. This is the real life projections. Here's what we're working with. You're not going to be any better than us or you guys can take it over, right? You're going to see that. You're going to see basically the residential market's different. We can talk about it. But so you're going to see that. And then you're also going to see the basically guys going in. They're going to see some bankruptcies going around too. Do you think those lenders are going to be flexible? I'm just thinking about the previous cycle before 2000. I, when I got in the market, I, there were so many problems in the receivership. You know? Yeah. And, and that was like about a year, two years. You know? uh, all these properties, the, the banks got it back. And they got signed well, I think I think Paul mentioned like I, I think that I, and I agree that that people are a lot more responsible these days. And I think that they've got better information. They're not making crazy loans. We were talking about way back when they, they're not doing that, you know. So I think you've got like real rent rolls, real operating statements. They, they have really good like information because the information system is changing. So I think you've got that's a lot different. And they can look at it and say, Do I really want to do this myself or do I want to have you do it? You know, and you know, you, you gotta go sweat it out, just push the do the, the kick the can down the road. I think that's gonna be the majority of it. So you think that most they're gonna be more a little more flexible than yeah. in the past. No, I don't think they're gonna come in and shoot everybody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? I, I agree with that. I mean, we're uh, from an office perspective, we are a lot of our values are getting closer to the loans and uh multifamily land where Everything's been unicorns and pixie dust until like six months ago. Um, so, yeah, just in, in our interactions with the lenders, they don't want to take back their properties. Um, the values may be kind of right on top of where their loan balance is, but they don't have the asset management team to effectively run these assets. And to the extent they have a sponsor that they trust and know that's going to continue to work the deals hard, they're much happier to kind of try to come up with an agreeable solution. And there's a business plan for them doing the last cycle, the you know, 08 to 12 cycle, where they worked with borrowers, they gave people time, they let the markets recover, and then they didn't have these massive kind of losses that they otherwise would have, they would have kind of cut bait on everything in 2009. So it's time for our crystal ball, everybody. <laughs> the things going to happen uh, beyond 2023. Tony, Mr. O'Connor, Austin, Paul. You know, it's hard to predict. I mean, it depends what the end is. And what some people are saying by the middle of next year, the fact that we will know to this sort of thing because we will see if we have a huge recession. Nobody can predict. Next. I looked at the price of the gallon of gasoline and, like Barack Obama was said, he could judge his presidency and his popularity by looking at what the price of gas is. So to the extent that that number is very high, I think we're gonna have very high interest rates. To the extent that that number comes down, I think that if you had one barrier, one thing to look at only, that's where you're gonna to have to look. So to the extent that they stay high, I think we're gonna be where we are now. To the extent that it starts moving away, and then there's gonna be a lagging of that. Who knows how long that takes? It's you know, lag times you spend hours talking about, but you know, maybe six months behind, a year. You know, where you have like people can actually afford their own lives again and they can afford to pay rent, etc. So, I that's a real crap. So, if I were going to say one thing, that's where I would go. Do I think that markets are going to get better? Always going to get better. It's not a state. We're going to, we're going to, we're, it's going to get better eventually. It always does and always will. But what this is going to be a, a serious hiccup in the road. People are going to have to make serious adjustments to this. I think, uh, you know, take it what I say for its worth. I, I had a bet with the agents in my office that I uh, I thought they were gonna we were gonna get a rate cut in December, and if we didn't, then I'd grow a handlebar mustache. <laughs> so that's gonna be pretty interesting. So I, I don't think that's happening. <laughs> but I, I I am looking at the end of first quarter 2023. Hopefully, you know, we, we've stabilized at least. And the the hikes stop, and you know, the, the pricing gap that I talked about. Kind of settles in and we just have a new normal um and i think there's some exciting things happening locally you know you've got the eviction moratorium burning off in february of next year that'll be great for a lot of owners that have the ability to you know evict some tenants that just haven't been paying rent and 
you know, candidly have been taking advantage of, uh, you know, laws that uh, have been really tough on a lot of landlords. And so, you know, you've got some positives there. We've got a, a local elections here in November that could help change the landscape. So I'm feeling very excited heading into next year and beyond. Uh, and, you know, like Tony said, there's always a market to make money, just as long as you know what market you're in. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm bullish. Brokers are paid for their optimism, by the way. Yes. <laughs> so as a landlord, um, yeah, I think I think inflation is kind of here to stay and stick around. Um, right now, investors are kind of getting evaluating the double whammy of pricing inflation and trying to understand that from a risk standpoint and what it means vis-a-vis -vis the Fed continuing to increase rates. Additionally, on top of that, they're pricing in re recession risk in the beginning of next year. So, you know, risk premiums and the returns that people are solving for are going up, which means that pricing is going to be going down, at least in the short term. Um, I think that we're, as an industry, we're going to take one step backwards. But to Michael's point, long term, I'm bullish and I think we'll take two steps forward. So, uh, trees don't grow to the sky. I think that uh, people, a lot of people are realizing that now. And um, But long term, I'm bullish. And I think that we tend to have a, we tend to have a tendency to overreact to things, right? Too much stimulus in the system from the government, too much interest rate hikes. It's kind of a little bit too whipsaw right now. But in time, I think things will kind of steady out. And I think we have really strong, interesting fundamentals. In our market here in Southern California is one of the most interesting, dynamic, long-term uh, positive markets in the United States. Yeah. I think real quick, yeah. just to add on to that, yeah. uh, you know, when you look at guys like Paul and, you know, what gets me really excited is when he's talking about conversion from office to residential and uh, the creativity that, you know, always comes out of a challenging market people are gonna figure out ways to create new avenues and, and solve problems that we're facing today. So uh, that's part of the reason why I feel so optimistic is the fact that uh, there's smarter people than me up here that are doing deals and uh, helping us solve issues that we're running into you know, as a population. Uh, and it's exciting to see you know, them be creative and come up with new solutions. I'm excited for 2023, I can tell you. I feel that uh, the interest rate is going to level off, you know, after the, maybe uh, the first quarter. But uh, there's a lot of uh, exciting news coming up, you know. So let's uh, switch a little bit. We have two more questions for uh, for students, and then we're going to open it up, and uh, you guys are going to get bombarded with questions. Uh, we want good Q and A, by the way. We're, we want the toughies. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from students, by the way. Uh, how does a student or recent grad make themselves marketable? In their current climate. So, someone graduating, let's say, this year, want to get into the market, into the industry. Uh, what do you recommend? Amazing time to get into the business. Yeah. Especially for a student. Yeah. And a lot of people probably will say, what is he talking about? The market is going down. You know, who is that We have real estate students here. That, uh, how many finance and, uh, students do you have? Entrepreneurship? When, when you enter the commercial real estate, it takes you a year be, before you get any traction. So during that year, you're preparing yourself from preparing your market area, your database, learning the business, uh, make sure you work with the right team of people who are expert in what they do. And within a year, you're gonna learn the industry more or less. And so during that downtime, the senior agent who is teaching you has a lot of time and time to teach you. And an up market, he doesn't have time to say hello to you. And this <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my feeling is I entered the business, uh, the commercial business in 86, and this is we had a slowdown at the time, and it was perfect timing for me. Plus, when you're making these calls, clients are willing to listen to you more than in the past. So don't be discouraged. Our business is always going to be there. Whether the market goes up, down, people are going to transact no matter what. Just do your best, work hard. It's going to be definitely harder work than before, but that's okay. If you're not made for it, don't join the business within. 
And this question for all the students in the back. What skills set would you recommend students focus on as they enter the real estate market today? We have a lot of students who want to become brokers, they want to become agents, they want to set up their own brokerage firms. What skills do they need like now? Consistent. Be determined to succeed. Work super hard and smart. And I said earlier, be honest to yourself and the client. Represent their best interest, and they are you're gonna succeed. And work hard. Don't take no for an answer. Just keep pushing. Thank you. And my favorite thing I say when you're going through hell, keep going. Good. <laughs> <laughs> good good. So we're gonna have a six seven minutes of Q and A. Question for anybody? Let's keep. Let's, let's, let's make it quick. I'll because, be quick. Yeah. Uh, how confident you guys are the Fed's gonna actually slow down pause? Yeah. And he's still basing stuff on CPI. Modi says that CPI should only be down until June. What do you guys think about? I mean, they're talking about pausing rates, but his playbook keeps saying bump, bump, bump. Let's say percent. It's not gonna happen until much later. So you guys are talking about March. Do you guys really think that's gonna happen? No. No, maybe not. <laughs> no, I think you should. I think if you're going to look historically, we're talking about history repeats itself. I think you go back to the Volcker um, and uh, Carter administration. The Volcker paused. Yeah, Powell's talking about nothing like, like 21 percent. Bro. Yeah, no, we're talking have... about. We're talking about. We're talking about. You have to. You have to get ahead of the price inflation. This whole thing was like, all right, we're at eight percent. I've got to get rates to eight percent. Yeah. That's. What you're looking at until you start to recede, and, and that, we're, we're already in a recession. Nobody wants to say that word, but we are. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, it, it's the truth. So, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? He's going to clamp down. I mean, he has to, because at some point you can't just have prices running away all the time, or you can't make any decisions. He's got to all the down. metrics that these guys are talking about don't matter at all if they keep moving on you. But how, how do you make a decision on cost and the cost even? But the problem is the interest rates he's expecting aren't necessarily addressing the core issues of our inflation. Energy costs are going to go up because they're capitalizing on the commodity they have for now. Right. You know, you're not going to see um, housing going down until you actually have enough supply and efforts like yours. To be honest, that's a really a good idea to get some housing out there. But the problem is we have a shortage in housing, we have a shortage in apartments, we have a yeah. shortage. We have energy costs of risk that we can't control with interest rates. Well, that's what's different about now. Than yeah, it is. I mean, Volcker right. faced 100, faced 30 percent GDP debt. Yeah, we're at 120. Yeah. It's a totally different market. It is. And the problem is measuring things by CPI is that we're not really addressing the major issues that are causing our inflation. Yeah, we're just kind of throwing a bomb at it and saying, no, hopefully it works. I mean, that, that, that again, it's just a guideline. That's the last time we had, and that, that's the last like. Kind of pretty much conquered inflation. Yeah, well, Volcker did the right thing, but you know, we, not keep, right we keep talking about shortage in housing. Yes, right. there is no shortage in housing except low income housing. We yeah. have vacancies. Drew, you have vacancies in your building. So if we have, if there's shortage in housing, why do we have vacancies? There is shortage in low income housing. That I agree. And no developer can build unless the government step in and help them to do low income housing. So they're putting everything on the developer, go do it, cost of construction is high. So there is no way you can afford to do it. So was, but the, is the Fed rates gonna, you know, the Fed's bumping this rate for this exact purpose. Yeah. Is it gonna work? Are we gonna see a relief? It's it? gonna keep getting higher. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's yes. gonna keep getting higher. Well, see, Drew, yeah. your comments? I mean, I think you're, you're spot on. I think there's a lot of external factors that they can't control. And I think they're aware of it. I mean, there's a lot of narrative on that right now. I mean, we have wars, we have a lot of stuff going on globally. That makes it a different situation. Why I think people are so nervous. You know, they're going to keep. He has to crank rates. Has to do that. Has to crash the economy. But are is inflation really going to you know slow down immediately? Supply chains are still affected. There's still a lot of issues to deal with globally. I agree. Anybody That's else? a oil price has come down. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Go ahead. Uh, first of all, it's still a question. Thank you guys for uh, coming out here tonight on behalf of the students and the uh, student run uh, real estate society. Uh, my second question is for more like recent graduates and like students in my position who have not as much access to capital. I know there are like loan programs out there for us as like FHA, like up to four units, of course. So it, it's not going to be like useful for somebody with like more than four units. But like, what what route would you recommend somebody who has not as much capital to take? Would you guys recommend like a 
a seven year adjust full rate and kind of walk out at five years? Would <laughs> you advise us to go with that FHA for that low down? I defer to my friend here. Uh, I really don't get involved in that council now, and so in it and below we don't really do. Uh, but coming out of school, I think you have no business getting in the market immediately, get some experience, learn the real estate business, then get involved, and you can raise the capital if you don't have the capital, but nobody's going to give you the capital unless you're confident. You, you know what you're doing. So that's my recommendation. And keep in mind that owner occupy is excellent, you know, on four units. I don't know that. You know, so basically, that's, that will be one, one option that you have. Next question, please. Um, so, even if, if you have the capital or even if you have the electric that have that tool, let's say that the competition will have a, we can all determine that the market where you both have, we all don't know. So, so then, do we have a game? Do we, where do we as students today, even without the capital, start? What is a hit list that we can make? And if I draw a line today and I say, okay, I like what I'm hearing, I'm interested, I want to read more, I want to go for it more, where do I start in this kind of market with this kind of rate <laughs> with everything going on? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. If, if you have the capital, in my opinion. You can buy, for example, let's take a rent control building in LA, right? The rents are low. If you have the capital to buy it and you're long term paying, you're always going to do well because your rent are not going any further down. If you're making money when you buy it because you put enough down, you're not going to get hurt no matter how bad the market is going to get. 10 years from now, you're going to look back and say, I'm glad I did it. If this is what you're looking for. Well, yeah, I think that, you know, kind of to dovetail on both your questions, I think it's great just to work for other people that specialize in the field that you want to get into if you eventually want to do something entrepreneurial yourself, because you're going to be going up against the best in the business, total pros, that all they do is eat, sleep, run numbers on buying apartments or whatever your product type is. So I think, you know, getting an internship or starting at kind of an analyst level and just getting reps and experience and seeing you know, 50, 100, 150, 200 deals. That way you'll kind of normalize, okay, what is the market? What does a good deal look like? What is my risk tolerance? What would I have done in this company's position? I think is really invaluable experience rather than just saying, hey, I've got some money or my grandma's got some money. I'm going to go buy a seven unit. And I'm going to do it in this city and just barreling in headlong two or three and you pick one. Like, I think getting the reps, getting the experience is important. Now is a particularly probably difficult time to get into the real estate industry. So, you know, you may have to alter your expectations for yourself on, you know, hey, I'm going to get a XYZ job. Maybe you end up a ring lower, or maybe you end up as an intern out of college, which can be kind of like, hey, I didn't go to college to be an intern or whatever. But uh, those are all valuable learning experiences. And, you know, I think one message I would have to the students is go somewhere where you can learn. Because the relative income on what you would make at one shop or the other, if you get in a situation where you can learn a lot, the whatever, 70 versus $60,000 starting salary kind of means nothing if you get that knowledge that you can turn into you know, bigger bucks or experience for yourself down the road as your own, own entrepreneur. Excellent recommendation, Paul. We have a question for you. That was one of the best I mean, that was a great thing to say. I have a number of students that are interested in getting into one, in particular second generation for those that family. But <clears throat> internships are important. What are you looking for? What would it take for you in this market to hire or bring in an intern? What skill? I'm not mean just dedication and hard work and ethics and yeah. I mean specific skill. Is it personally? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. That question is for every single one, if you don't mind. Yeah, that's that's excellent okay. question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for me specifically, there's, you know, multifamily, you underwrite using Excel, Microsoft Excel by and large. So you go to a shop, you get their model, you learn how the variables work. For the other commercial product types, you use a software program called Argus, Argus mm -hmm. Enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, having a mastery of that, if you're going to take an acquisitions track, which is what I do day to day, um, is kind of an important must do skill set. So there's Argus certifications. You can do it, you know, nights, weekends, Christmas breaks, whatever. But rolling in and saying, hey, I'm Argus certified, 
I'll work for free. I have a great attitude. I'm still a student. I want to learn and I just need reps and I want to get some level of experience. I think it's important. And for me in my career journey, the hardest job for me to get was my first internship. And then once I got a foot in the door at the internship, the other positions just start building on yourself. And once you're in the door, it became easier and easier, but just breaking in, I think is the hardest. You have to have tenacity to do it. You have to be ready to email 50 people and say, I'm only going to get one or two calls back and not be discouraged. I just want to jump in on something real quickly. So the Argus certification, the students in the room, our REAC actually sponsored and supported our students getting Argus certified. So I want to thank the REAC because that wasn't something that was that we could do out of our operating budget. So the fact that the REAC um, supported it allowed a few of our students to get Argus certified last year. And uh, much appreciated. That's great. Nelson? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm always looking to, to hire, uh, you know, good, competitive, professional individuals. Uh, I think, you know, there's very simple things you can do as a potential candidate, you know, things such as a follow-up email after an interview, uh, you know, being genuinely curious within the interview and, and asking to reach out to other brokers, you know, uh, the agents in my office are always looking for talent, which, you know, it, it's hard to find. Uh, and so, you know, showing just uh, a basic ca capacity of the uh, financial operations and terms that go into a real estate transaction will give you a leg up. But I would say just persistence and, uh, you know, professionalism, believe it or not, it separates you from the pack. Thank you. What's your comment? Well, it kind of depends on what but I mean, a lot of this is brokerage based, right? We're yeah. talking about a lot of brokerage stuff. Yeah. But there's a lot of other things in real estate too, like what you do is not brokerage based at all. So I think that, you know, I would pair what you had to say there about, you know, the artist program, which is fantastic, by the way. Um, that's real value. So you can use somebody to, to do that. But generally speaking, with what I do, it's, they're just going to hang around and listen to the phone calls. It's <laughs> like, you know, in three months, you're not going to get it. It, it takes a year at least to start to even understand how to do your job. I, I think that um, one of the best places that you can go, right, there are two. One is being a, an appraisal associate mm -hmm. where you're just going in and you're getting that stuff down because there's so many things that have to do with like back to value. Yeah. And then the second is working for a lender. Mm -hmm. That's a really good perspective because everybody's going to end up talking to a lender. A lot of people mostly won't be a lender, but they will then they have a little empathy for the other side. And so they understand how lenders look at stuff because it's, it's a different take and you have really have a different take and they, they do have sponsored programs. I'm glad to talk to you all about that too. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot of different avenues, but once you get these guys up to speed on, you know, artists or what have you, then you have to do it. You know, you have a chance of getting something at JP Morgan or, you know, you name it. Around everybody's looking for that all the time. Yeah, because they want to recruit in their own company. Yes. Uh, I think there's actually more. Okay, uh, we have one question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, you guys briefly talked about the foreclosures. I'm just address that. I haven't had the doctor one, hopefully. Um, what's the time frame on the foreclosures and how does that affect, like, how does that go back to market? When do the creditors come in? Yeah, or just like a little bit more. We haven't seen the foreclosures, uh, well, a few years already, right? That, that, that industry. But, uh, What's your feedback on that? Uh, just the time frame and the mechanics. Yeah, how does that work? Yeah, so effectively, you know, the project can't cover the debt service or you're out of time and you can't put a replacement loan. However, you got yourself into your into your pickle, you know, typically it's a three to six month foreclosure process um, where you know they kind of are sending you demand letters and you gotta do this, and you gotta do that. And if you don't, you know, they basically there's a judicial process they go through to. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, Thanks, Paul. We have two more questions and uh, we can uh, wrap it up tonight. Go ahead. Uh, sure. I got uh, kind of two questions based off of a couple of things I heard you say. Um, Michael, you mentioned uh, a deal in Idaho. Uh, I was just wondering how you go about mm -hmm. approaching things like at a distance, like out of state or things well, so like that. It's, it's kind of an odd story because I have a house that I grew up in that's literally. I'm in, uh, maybe a thousand yards away, maybe last 500. Um, and the guy is, is a developer that I know from Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of stuck with this thing. 
in town. It's like legendary. You can look it up the hole and catch my eye. And uh, if you look that up, you'll see it. So basically, I just started working on it because I was like, you know, we can get this thing done. So I provided a construction commitment for Pierre and Elijah. Did. And then what happened was they got replaced by a um, group that came in with all equity. And it's just, you know, it's a rare deal. It's in a ski resort. It's right on the corner. It's kind of this sexy thing. If you want to, go get my card and I'll, I'll send you over the package as long as he's cool with it. But, you know, it's done now. They're, they're, they're the last stages of the process. But what happened, the whole gig in, a, in that kind of deal is that you want to drive down the, the remaining bases in the hotel rooms. The risk is that you don't have enough rent coming in from the hotel rooms to pay all the debt service or whatever you've got left in the property. So what's happened is price tags went up, but our our values in that instance went way above where those were. And it just, now we can just dump it back into the project. So you know, it's a hundred million dollar deal. It's a, when you're done, it's gonna be, we'll have probably $40 million up in the other portion of the building just because of the condo sales. So they're, and they're all pre sold These guys are writing some pretty big checks around. But price tags just went crazy, like Jackson did. All the American ski resorts, Jackson, um, Aspen, and Valley, et cetera, they all went off. Uh, Park City, about Bama, you know. So those kind of markets have gone like that. And it's just a weird deal. Just like so much about it is his timing. He worked on the thing for 14 years. So I didn't do it. Did I go call on him? No. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. They, they kind of. We don't have a kid, bro. Really. Yeah, about your age or something. So we have enough time to do this. One more question. Anybody else? Yeah. So my question is directed towards uh, Mr. Bezzi for the most part, since yeah. you mentioned that there was a severe shortage primarily in low income housing. I work for a general contracting company in project management, and our team has stayed the same size, and we keep taking on bids for more and more projects, primarily in Southern and Northern California. And so when we get approached for low income housing, and our team stay, stays the same size, on top of steel shortages, wood shortages, the lumber shortages, and primarily the most job shortages in project management. From your point of view, combined with the political and bureaucratic red tape, especially in California, do you see any maybe dynamic solutions that could come in place either in the private or in the public sector? Well, they're talking about one solution, which probably I'm going to vote against. Uh, what do you call it? The QL 5% uh, 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 What do you want to do? Yeah, it's a UL, yeah. UL, whatever it is. And they're saying they're going to raise billions of dollars, and that's going to go for development. They're going to go build low income housing. Uh, this is not the solution. The government's always looking to ask more people to solve their issues. So, really, if you want to get it resolved, is when you look at uh, the city of LA. The statistic they have done, they spent an average $850,000 per home to for the homeless or low income. You know how many apartments you can buy and how many people I can put that says only $850,000 here in the business? <laughs> it doesn't take genius to figure it out. Cut that rate and you can get the job done, but they don't want to do it with the politician. You know, that's the way it is. Thank you. Uh, well, let me call the panelists. <laughs>
drive value. So you have real world experience of what's going on in the market. This was phenomenal, by the way. I, I, I really appreciate everybody taking the time to do this. Uh, I learned a ton and uh, uh, I can't wait. I, I was thinking we should really come back and say, this was Michael Connor's prediction. Yeah. What actually <laughs> yeah. happened? We're going to be later on with that note of liability associated with it. <laughs> Keep in mind that we also is hybrid with the firm as well. You know? It is, yeah. And Anthony's class, I think 60. Yeah, about 60, 40 uh, virtual networks. Yep. So we did it in here, right? In one we did it upstairs. Oh, upstairs yeah. in 300. Yeah. 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 I mean, if enough people come, we can get this space. How many, yeah. how many more classes we have this year? Yeah, we have another uh, 10. Huh? So it's, 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 can we go in a warmer room next time? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to wrap it up. We're going to have a good night. Thank you for the Thank you. Thank you.